Yeah, so welcome again and thanks to everyone to uh, join our first colloquium of the quarter. This is super exciting. Uh, let me first introduce our honored speaker, Dr. Sandra gonzalez Bailon. Dr. gonzalez Bailon is an associate professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, where she is also an affiliate faculty member at the Warren Center for Network and Data Sciences. At Annenberg, she directs the research group DIMINET, acronym for Digital Media, Networks and Political Communication. Professor Gonzalez Bailon's research lies at the intersection of network science, data mining, computational tools, and political communication. You can access her scholarship in leading journals like PANAS, Nature, Science, Political Communication, the Journal of Communication, and Social Networks, among a host of other outlets. She has also written or edited two volumes, Decoding the Social World, published by MIT Press in 2017, and with Brooke Foucault Wallace, co edited the Oxford Handbook of Network Communication, which was published in 2020. Prior to joining Penn, Professor Gonzalez Bailon was a research fellow at the Oxford in Internet Institute from 2008 to 2013. Her academic path began when she enrolled at the University of Barcelona for her undergraduate studies. She earned both her master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Oxford, where she stayed as a postdoc. In addition to her research, Sandra sits on the editorial board of Computational Communication Research and the Journal of Quantitative Description, Digital Media. She is also an associate editor for three journals, Social Networks, EPJ Data Science, and the International Journal of Press Politics. Please join us today in welcoming Dr. Sandra gonzalez Bailon. Thank you for coming here. Thank you so much, Yuan, and you make me blush, but I'm going to try to share my screen because experience tells me that usually, okay, I think it's working. <laughs> okay, so you can see the screen, no problem. So thank you, thank you again, uh, Yuan. It's really a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I never take these invitations for granted. I think it's a luxury that we get paid to exchange ideas and, and talk with smart people, and so it is really my pleasure to be here. I just wish we could meet in person, but hopefully I meet many of you in Paris. And so today I wanna to talk um, about a series of, of recent projects that aim to uncover the way in which exposure to news happens across media channels. And in particular, the, the studies that I want to discuss cast light on the choices that we make when consuming news media and how those choices create asymmetries and biases in online information. And I focus on choices because I want to steer away from prevalent discourses that blame social media for everything bad that happens. And I want to refocus a little bit on the fact that uh, uh, most people are not necessarily making the choices that would allow them to meet this democratic ideal of the informed citizen. And this is not to say that um, social media are not doing things that are wrong, they are, <laughs> but I'm refocusing sort of the lens um, to highlight that the, the fact that we, the people, um, still have agency and that our choices uh, still reveal our interests. And these interests are not necessarily um, leading us uh, towards high quality news. And so I wanna start with sort of the bird's eye view of my current research, which generally tries to understand the, the consequences of having transition from the broadcast era when the number of news sources were limited and most citizens were exposed to the same information to the current era of network communication, which is characterized by a long tail of media options and by rising numbers in the supply of news. And as you know, the digital transformation has changed how news are supplied, but also how they are consumed. Um, research tells us that there are long tails on both sides of this equation. On the supply side, there are many sources, but only a handful of those sources attract high levels of attention. The rest create pockets of, uh, of specialized or niche audiences. And on the demand side, there is uh, a minority of politically, highly politically interested individuals who drive most of the action that we measure on the aggregate when we look at the rich. Uh, of these news outlets. Um, and so 
this is the, mo the, the, the small group of what we could we could call political junkies. <laughs> this small group create most of the traffic and most of the attention around news and political information. And so, again, as you know, there's many accounts suggesting that this increased choice leads to audience fragmentation, ideological segregation, echo chambers with no cross-cutting exposure, and also um, that the, there's research suggesting that the decentralized nature of these communication networks is increasing attempts to manipulate information and seed the networks with false or misleading content. And so the research problem that I guess my research agenda is trying to attack <laughs> in, in, right now is it boils down to two key pieces. On the one hand, there is the question of exposure. And on the other hand, there is the question of the effects that exposure has on individual and collective behavior. And so if exposure is driven by self-selection, meaning that people choose to read only those sources that they already agree with, and the fear is that these will reinforce or exacerbate polarization. If certain types of content are amplified, say by bots or by algorithms, the fear is that these will exacerbate conflict. And if false information prevails um, in the content that people get exposed to, then the fear is that these can lead to opinion manipulation and harmful uh, behavior, which is a possibility that the, the pandemic has placed at the center of, of many policy discussions. Now, of course, substantiating all these fears requires evidence and taking the right measurements of both exposure and effects is anything but easy. Most journalistic accounts we encounter are based on anecdotal evidence on the one case that perfectly illustrates an argument. And so it's up to us researchers to provide the bigger picture of how prevalent these dynamics are. The good news is that digital trails have made it much easier to analyze exposure to media content. But of course, on the flip side, those trails and the, uh, that digital data, those sources of digital data in general are no panacea either. They are far from perfect or noiseless. Um, and so as we discuss in this piece, um, digital data still needs to be distilled into meaningful measures that capture the complexity and the interdependence of human behavior. And I think this will resonate with most of you, right? The quality and the significance of our research depends really on the quality of our measures. And that means that we need to be constantly thinking about how to improve the measures that we use to build our theories. And of course, our theories of how media and social media shape access to information or misinformation are no exception. And so as we discuss in the article, for instance, once upon a time, uh, we used surveys to measure exposure to news. And now we have come to realize that surveys are very limited when it comes to giving us accurate measures um, uh, of exposure, particularly so in this complex information environment that we inhabit today. And so we know that behavioral patterns can give us more precise estimates of the information that people consume. But of course, as I mentioned, behavioral data also has its limitations and it requires at the bare minimum, it requires a series of analytical steps to process the raw material. So the data in its raw format to then be able to uh, extract conclusions to inform interventions or, or to inform future research questions. This is something that my team and I have tried to do in recent years to analyze patterns in news consumption that can be compared across time and political contexts. Um, the two studies that I want to discuss today build on this prior work, and so I thought I would just start by giving you a sense of what we did in this prior work uh, before I go into the details of the of the actual papers that I want to that I want to discuss today. Now, one of the things we do with this past work is analyze news consumption as networks of co-exposure, and uh, here the nodes are news sources, and the ties measure the amount of overlap in uh, in the audiences of these of these sources. And so this allows us to determine if news diets are growing increasingly richer over time or whether there is clustering in the consumption of news along ideological divides. One of the things that we found in this research is that the answer to these questions really depends on whether the data analyzed includes mobile access, right? The data that includes multi-platform estimates. Um, and so what this means is essentially exposure to news across devices. When we analyze that data, uh, we showed increasing trends in network density and co-exposure that we would miss if we only analyze desktop-based behavior, which is what the vast majority of research to date 
has done, partly because it is logistically easier to install plugins in your web browser when you're using a desktop computer than track what you do when you're on your cell phone. Um, and and you know, so, so that's probably one of the reasons why most research today we're using a source of data that it turns out give us a very different picture of how uh, exposure to news is evolving over time. Another thing that we found through the combination of web tracking data and social media data is that legitimate news sources um, still attract more visibility within the confines of social media platforms. And that this is the case across political context. And so in the particular study that I'm referring to here, we analyze data from France and Spain. So on the basis of this prior work, and again, just to contextualize the, the two studies that I want to discuss um, today, on the basis of this prior work, we concluded that one, there is evidence of selective exposure along ideological lines, but that, um, but we also show that ideology alone does not explain changes in the co-exposure networks. Um, people consuming news online are increasingly consuming news from a wider range of sources, uh, which essentially means that they are not being trapped in, in eco chambers. Um, we also find that a large fraction of the online population bordering the majority are not consuming any news on the web at all. And these to us points to a much more profound form of selective exposure than the, the usual focus on ideology or partisanship suggests. And indicates that there's also, it tells us that there is also a growing inequality between those who consume news and those who don't. Likewise, uh, even though our social media research um, shows that traditional outlets are still the main sources of information. We also uh, show that automated accounts are still generating a disproportionate amount of content. And although we find no evidence that these automated accounts distort the visibility of new sources, they are still seeding social media networks with high volumes of information. And so, in terms of the limitations, which is always the starting point for additional research, uh, this past work is limited in a number of ways. Our work on co-exposure networks, for instance, operates on the aggregate level. So we didn't gain much insight into who is creating those co-exposure ties. Um, likewise, uh, it was data restricted to web traffic. So we couldn't answer the question of how co-exposure networks differ across media channels, right? So maybe there is more evidence of polarization within social media compared to the web. And, um, you know, and TV is still the main source of news for the vast majority of people. Um, we also couldn't really look into the demographic divides that separate the political junkies from the majority um, of the population who consume very little news or those who opt out completely. Um, and likewise, in our prior work, we didn't look explicitly at unreliable information, right? Many of the media outlets that we treated as traditional or legitimate news sources, they, and I'm thinking particularly Fox News, they are also spreading misinformation. Um, and we didn't look at that. And we also didn't look at whether there are any ideological asymmetries in the prevalence of news. Uh, existing literature seems to be uh, pointing in the direction that this is a pattern, that there is asymmetry also in how um, uh, news circulate um, uh, online. And so this is where the two studies that I want to discuss in more depth today come in, right? They were designed uh, to try to uh, solve or alleviate some of these limitations. In these two studies, we again rely on web tracking and social media data. Um, and in these two specific studies, we focus exclusively on the US. Um, uh, but I want to emphasize my commitment to comparative work and sort of trying to extrapolate our conclusions to political contexts other than the US. Um, in any case, the two studies that I'm going to start digging into now are intended to solve some of these limitations that we couldn't solve in past, in past work. The first of these studies um, analyzes exposure to news um, for the same subset of individuals across TV, the web, and YouTube. And just to anticipate the main findings, we find that less than 10% of our panelists, so this is about 5,300 individuals, view and browse news on the three platforms, right? This is the small group of hyper consumers that I was uh, talking about before, the, the small group of political junkies. And this small group is formed predominantly by older male users with higher education. We also find no evidence of substitution effects in the time that these users spend consuming news on each of the three media channels. So controlling for demographics and random effects. 
an increase on news time on one platform has a positive impact on news time on, on the other two platforms. And this is a study that we use to try to uncover what we think are important demographic divides in how audiences navigate a high choice media environment, which um, you know, suggests that only an unrepresentative minority of users engaging um, uh, with uh, is engaging with news content across the media landscape. And this has, of course, implications for how we think about opinion leaders and the role that they play as mediators uh, to information. And just because uh, I always say this when I give presentations like this, there's only so much time and so much detail I can go into. Um, if you are interested in getting all those details, you, uh, there's the working paper um, is online. And um, I just want to say here that this is joint work with Tian Yang, who is going to be an assistant professor soon. So um, here's the proud advisor uh, looking forward to, to seeing what, what her students are going to do in the future. But anyway, I used to present this saying he's in the job market, not anymore. So that's great news. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the data that we are using in this, in this project. So the data in this research comes from the Nielsen TV and web panels. These two panels span the period of January 2016 to August 2019. The TV panels tracks viewing behavior for both live and recorded national TV on a minute by minute basis for about 300,000 unique panelists. And it includes information of the name of the program and the station being watched. The web panel tracks desktop web browsing behavior for about 365,000 unique panelists, and it contains information on the URLs visited uh, by these panelists and the duration of the visit. And there is an overlap of about 55,000 unique panelists between the TV and uh, the web panels, which means that we can track their exposure to news across media channels, right? The, the analysis that I will discuss here are based on the subset of intersecting panelists um, in the paper's supplementary materials. There's also an additional battery of analysis with uh, where we look at the two separate panels. Um, as mentioned, the web panel contains information on the URLs visited, and this is what allowed us to identify viewing activity within YouTube's domain, right? So what we did was to identify all the YouTube URLs and then we use the platform's API um, to query additional information um, about those videos. And so we obtain things like um, you know, metadata, like the publishing date, the channel, the category, numbers of likes, views, and comments, and so forth. Uh, for the purposes of the research that I want to discuss here, the most important metadata was kind of the, the that that we use is it refers to the channel and the category under which the videos were classified. Um, okay, so that's the data. This is a visual description of the data. As I said, the panel data we analyzed tracks co-exposure to new sources within and across media platforms, so TV, web, and YouTube for the same set of unique panelists. So this is about 55,000 panelists. We have um, time-stamped individual level exposure measures to new sources within and across media channels. So that's what we try to illustrate in panel A. What we show in panel B, is essentially that YouTube offers many more choices of news sources than TV or the web um, in terms of a number of news channels. Um, on the web, we're talking about news sites. But, uh, so, but so, so YouTube offers way more options, um, but it lags substantially behind in terms of reach, right? So, and this is what we uh, show in panel C. So if we look at the number of unique panelists visiting these sources, what we show in panel C is that um, uh, YouTube, by comparison to the web and especially to TV, lags substantially behind in terms of overall reach, which is as expected, right? Like we weren't expecting to see anything different here. TV is still the main source of information for most people. And then what we show in panel D are measures of inequality in the distribution of those audiences, right? So here we show that audiences on TV and the web exhibit similar levels of concentration around a handful of news sources, whereas YouTube uh, is much more decentralized um, than the TV and the web, um, according to the Gini coefficient, which is like a conventional measure of concentration uh, in distributions. In this figure, we have additional descriptive information. And so here we show the relative prevalence of news content in viewing patterns for the TV and the YouTube data. 
Um, so clearly news content is much more common in TV news diets, uh, which again is consistent with our priors and with, um, with existing work. About 25% of people watching TV watch news programs, but the percentage for YouTube users is about 5%, right? And so of all the people, of all the panelists who access YouTube, only 5% uh, we're consuming news, we're consuming videos classified as news uh, while on, on the platform. And so the denominators here are all programs watched and all videos watched. Um, here we look at the fraction of all panelists that accessed one or more channels for TV and for YouTube or one or more websites for the web during our observation period. Uh, just to know that the vertical white lines uh, stand for five missing months in the data. We are not sure why we were missing those months, but in any case, they don't uh, hamper our kind of reading of, of temporal trends. And so if you remember what I said before about co-exposure networks, what we're doing here is to try to assess how many people are forming um, um, sort of those co-exposure networks, right? Uh, about 80% of all panelists are exposed to at least one news channel on TV. Less than half of the panelists access at least one news domain. In a substantially smaller fraction of panelists access news uh, channels on YouTube, again, less than 5%. But unlike what we see with the TV and, panel and, and web data, this percentage, the percentage of um, panelists using YouTube for news is increasing during the observation period. Um, the percentages are small, but the trends are the opposite of what we see with the web and with, with uh, what TV. Now, another caveat that I wanna add here is um, that the Nielsen data is very rich in many ways. It allows us to go uh, in depth into the analysis of demographics. It, is, it has high temporal resolution. It allows us to go to the URL level, but it relies only on desktop behavior. And if you remember what I said before about what we discovered in past work, uh, for which we were using an alternative data source, Comscore, um, we are likely underestimating exposure uh, to news uh, since we're only using access through desktop computers. And this is a time period over which mobile access increased substantially, right? And this is a part of um, exposure to information that we are not capturing because Nielsen only gives us uh, um, behavioral trace data monitor through desktop computers. So we are aware that we are likely underestimating um, what essentially panels B and C tell us. Um, uh, and so that the trends would probably look different if we were analyzing mobile uh, and app access as well. So here we look, um, really this is the heart of, uh, or at least one of the key pieces of the, of the paper. We look at the demographic correlates of news exposure. And this is the sort of thing that we couldn't do with uh, in, in prior work. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. In research, you're always uh, losing some to win some. So we win detail and granularity, we lose uh, access to mobile devices. Um, but so essentially, this is one of the things that we wanted to uncover, right? So which demographic uh, correlates, so which, which demographic attributes allow us to understand a little bit better who's consuming news in each of these three channels and on all three. The first thing to note in this figure is that, as I anticipated, only about 5,300 of all our panelists access news sources on the three platforms, so that's less than 10%. The model suggests that age is the most important predictor of news exposure compared to the base category, which is the 18 to 25 group. Older panelists are more likely to consume news on TV and the web and less likely to access news on YouTube. Um, education is positively correlated with online news consumption, and women are less likely to access news online. Um, they're also clearly less likely to consume news um, from all the three platforms or across the three platforms, and this is what we show in panel C. However, if we look at time spent on, on these channels, we find no evidence of substitution effects. Uh, time spent consuming news on one platform increases, again, as I anticipated, time spent consuming news on another platform, except for YouTube. Um, um, so, you know, which doesn't seem to have a significant impact on TV news time. The coefficients that we show here are estimates controlling for all other demographic variables and for random effects at the month and the panelist level. So this is nested data, right? So, the pan so we have repeated measures for the same panelist at different points in time. Um, and so we do try to control for these, for, you know, for, for time effects and sort of um, uh, for individual heterogeneity. 
And so these are the net kind of the, these are the effects that we get controlling for all, all, those, all those things. And so essentially what these results suggest is that online media is amplifying already high levels of interest in the news um, for the subset of the population that uh, consume news, which we have already determined is not uh, a representative group. Now, what do we draw from here? Um, well, the first thing is that our findings suggest that online media does help achieve this normative ideal of the informed citizen by boosting news exposure, right? Um, rather than triggering substitution effects, as some um, researchers have suggested in the past, we find that online media is amplifying time spent consuming news. It's adding, it's not subtracting. But this amplification effect only benefits those who are already interested in the news. And this is, as I've discussed, this is a small fraction of the population, less than 10%. What this is revealing is that we have important demographic divides. And in particular, women are clearly less likely to use online sources to consume news, even after controlling for education and for employment status. And so the, you know, the existence of gender gaps in the consumption of news is not necessarily that new. It was documented years ago, but the fact that these divides remain visible more than 20 years later and in a high choice media environment is suggestive of the constraints that many individuals still face to meet this uh, normative um, ideal uh, of what an engaged citizen should look like. More generally, our results help us characterize in a way, the, the digital equivalent of opinion leaders, right, which is a figure that all of you will know, it was first proposed to understand the effects of mass media by Lazarus Fell and Katz. The, you know, these are essentially the small group of individuals that consume media content um, and then pass it on through their networks of interpersonal contacts, potentially, and I emphasize potentially, triggering a chain of social influence and opinion formation. And so in this digital age, those networks are largely mediated by internet technologies like social media. And so the hyper consumers that we identify, the political junkies that we identify in our analysis are effectively creating this elite of opinion leaders that are then likely to propagate their own curated news through their networks. And so the fact that this small group of opinion leaders is far from representing the population at large and feels one of the ways in which the information circulating online may be perpetuating important biases um, in the salience of some topics over others. Um, and I think this is one of the areas that I believe uh, future research should investigate further, right? The impact that hyper consumers, that political junkies have on information bias and other types of information inequities propagating online. We do know that they are driving a lot of the action that we map on the aggregate, right? Um, uh, it's kind of this Pareto dynamics, a small fraction of the population is driving most of the action that we monitor online. We haven't paid too much attention of the implications of this for the kind of the sort of information bias or information inequities that may be perpetuated in the process. But of course, I can only speculate about that because none of our data allows us to attack that question directly. Um, I'm ready to move to the second paper. I just want to make sure that there's no questions or I should, is, is the idea that I should keep on going and then all the questions in the end, or should we stop here? Uh, what do you prefer? Do you want us to jump in now or do, do you want to just check along? I, I have no preference. I just want to make sure that you have a, that you don't feel sorry for interrupting or anything like that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to move on to a different study now. So if there's an urgent question that can't wait, I'm happy to address it now. Otherwise, I can keep on going, <laughs> and we can have yeah. it. <laughs> uh, conventionally, we just kind of keep on going. So unless somebody has an urgent right. question, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, so go let's ahead. do that. Okay. So moving on, <laughs> this idea of information with this idea of information bias hanging in the air. Um, I want to move on to the second project, and um, here we look uh, into the prevalence of unreliable information on social media during protest uh, mobilizations, which is something that we didn't fully address in our previous work. And in particular, we try to determine if there are a, a ideological, ideological asymmetries in the sharing of news covering those mobilizations. And again, just to anticipate the findings, we show essentially two things. We show that there is no evidence of unreliable sources having any uh, prominent visibility during the protest period, but we do identify asymmetries in the um, ideological slant of the, the sources that were being shared with a clear bias 
towards right-leaning domains. Um, and this supports what we call the conservative advantage thesis, which po points to the, um, in a way, the structural conditions, social and technological, that allow better message production from the right. And again, all the details are in the paper. This is still under review, and so we are doing some changes, but um, if you're interested in the details, you can find them here. And this is joint work with Valeria D'Andrea and Manuel de Domenico, uh, who are both based in Italy, and our STEM colleague, Dean Freelon, who I'm pretty sure you all know. And so the context for this project um, are the protests that followed the, uh, the death of George Floyd in June of 2020, the killing of George Floyd. And these protests became one of the largest protests, as you know, uh, in US history, consolidated the Black Lives Matter movement as a global movement. In line with the research that we did with the protest data from uh, France and Spain in this paper, we also want to test some intuitions about how the Twitter stream amplified news coverage of these mobilizations. And so this figure gives uh, a first glimpse of our data. The upper row shows the number and location of protests organized in the contiguous United States according to crowd counting which is a consortium of researchers that compile data on uh, political protests through news stories, as well as individual reports. And the lower row, so panel C and D, they show the count and the location of the tweets in our data set. And so the overall goal of this figure essentially is to show that Twitter activity, the Twitter activity we analyze reflects a similar temporal and spatial distribution to um, offline protest events uh, with June 6 being the day of greatest activity. We also show that most of the tweets in line with, with what we documented in the previous paper and what other people have documented are generated by human accounts. So that's about 58% of all accounts, but unverified bots. Um, so that would be 42% approx generate a very large fraction of the total volume and verified media accounts um, uh, amount to less than 1% uh, and they generate a very small fraction of messages. Um, what we define as, ver as verified media accounts are essentially uh, accounts that our uh, bot classifier um, uh, labels as automated, but that has also been verified by Twitter. This is a categorization that we used in the past paper, um, and it's our way of identifying uh, uh, accounts of public relevance. And the, this uh, category of Twitter accounts include journalists, news organizations, um, public intellectuals. And I am um, very uh, acutely aware of how limited these um, labeling models to predict whether an account is a bot or a human, how limited they are. But overall, I think it captures pretty well what we're interested in capturing, um, which is essentially, I'm particularly interested in this small category of media accounts, right? So those that have the blue check but that the, the models also predict as being um, automated. The appendix in the paper has all the technical details if you're interested about the classifier that we use and our own reflection on how, you know, an out of sample performance, which is far from perfect, but it's still kind of one of the research frontiers in, in these kind of um, um, modeling um, um, techniques. Um, this is uh, a figure that gives us another glimpse um, uh, of the data. In panel A, we show a breakdown of all the URLs that were shared on Twitter during this protest period. Most of the URLs go to news and information domains. If you look at the inset uh, within this category, um, local news prevail, which makes sense considering that a lot of the action was happening on the streets, right? And so there were lots, lots of local protests and those were being covered by local outlets. In panel B, we show the ideological scores of these domains, which we obtain using the same metric we employed in one of our past studies. So essentially, we use Comscore web browsing data that also contains information about the self-declared ideology and political outlook of the panelists. And so what this allows us to do is to assign ideological labels to news outlets on the basis of the people who's visiting those outlets. And we use the score that we call the favorability score that essentially is the ratio of um, self-declared Republicans and Democrats over the sum who are accessing the, these, these domains. And so uh, it's a way of assigning ideological labels to news sources or to, to any kind of website um, uh, on the basis of audience composition, right? So on the basis of who prevails in their audience base 
um, uh, we use that to assign those labels. Uh, another approach would have been to analyze the content of uh, the websites or kind of for, which makes sense for new sources. It doesn't make so much sense for other types of websites. Um, and so we are following prior um, literature in using this particular um, approach to classifying the ideology kind of the or assigning labels, ideological labels to, to domains. And but I want to emphasize this is that this is audience driven. So strictly speaking, if a domain is labeled as Republican leaning, what it means is that the, there is, uh, the audience is consuming or accessing that domain using the web browsing data uh, leaning Republican. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, um, agnostic about the content, the actual content of, of the news. Um, and so essentially to sum up <laughs> the, with this score, the closer the score gets to minus one, uh, um, the, um, the more of the audience of the domain self identifies as uh, Democrat or liberal and vice versa, the closer this favorability score gets to plus one, uh, the, the more of its audience self identifies as Republican or conservative. Panel C, and so here we have the full distribution of those scores in panel B. Uh, panel C looks at the association between the audience reach of these domains on the web. So that's the fraction of the US online population accessing the domains during this uh, period and the number of tweets that contain URLs um, uh, to those domains. And I just want to note that in the plot, uh, we only show a few labels to improve legibility. And so essentially domains in blue have audiences that lean Democrat, domains in red have audiences that lean Republican. And this is just my way of introducing our, kind of our main variables. Uh, what we see in panel D are the results of a regression model that incorporates all this information. And so this is a linear model predicting domain visibility, which we measure as total URLs shared and unique uh, URLs uh, shared. And so uh, what the model tells us essentially is that audience reach on the web is the most important predictor of visibility on Twitter and URLs pointing to news information, news and information sources are also more salient than non-news URLs, but controlling for these two variables, what we say is that Republican leaning URLs appear in more tweets. Um, so they, they are more salient. Uh, but controlling for these conservative leaning URLs appear in less. And I'm going to say a little bit more about these um, somehow conflictive findings uh, later. What we see here is a breakdown of the favorability scores uh, of the ideology distributions by domain subcategories. So here we have local news, general news, and politics. So essentially, what we see here is that the right leaning slant is particularly clear for political or partisan domains. Um, this is a category where we have domains like the hill.com, the getaway pundit, Mother Jones, or, or Western Journal. Uh, and again, these are the domains that were being shared in the same stream of information that was uh, um, revolving around the, these process mobilizations. Now, if we change the unit of analysis from URLs to users, right? Um, so the Twitter users posting those URLs, we find that posting URLs increases the number of retweets that those users get. That's what we see in panel A. This is another uh, regression. So in this case, a dependent variable is the number of retweets received by the users posting these, these uh, messages. And so posting URLs does increase number of retweets uh, received. Uh, so it does increase diffusion potential, right? So users posting URLs get more retweets, so they get um, um, their messages travel more through the network. Um, and so what we show in panel B is that uh, controlling, sort of looking at these messages that contain URLs, posting Republican leaning uh, URLs also has a positive impact on the number of shares that those posts uh, receive. And again, we see that controlling for partisanship uh, conservative leaning URLs um, seem to receive uh, 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 less diffusion. And what this means um, uh, is that what we call the advantage of the right has a limit, right? The most extreme outlets on the conservative distribution do not attain the same level of visibility as the more moderate right leaning outlets, which are right leaning nonetheless. Right? That's how we um, interpret. Uh, these results and the supplementary materials has lots of other analyses and more kind of qualitative in-depth <laughs> assessment of the data that um, that allowed us to to reach this conclusion. In panel C, we look at the actual retweet network. We collapsed it to the approximately 280 communities that we identified using a random walk algorithm. It wouldn't be 
feasible I, the, the, if we were to plot the retweet network where the nodes are individual users the network would be too messy to see anything so here the nodes are representing communities so every community represents a group of accounts that retweet each other uh, more frequently um, internally than accounts in other communities the color in this visualization encodes the reliability score that is assigned to each community uh, based on the URLs shared. And just to give you a sense of where we get this reliability score, um, this is a score that was provided to us by NewsGuard, um, which is a journalism and technology uh, company that rates the credibility of news and information websites. Um, each side receives a trust score on a 1 to 100 scale based on nine criteria. Essentially, five of these criteria are related to credibility and four are related to um, transparency. And so websites that receive a score of 60 points or higher receive a green rating. Um, so that means that the website follows basic standards of credibility and transparency. Below 60 points, websites receive a red rating meaning the website fails to meet basic standards of credibility and transparency. And so essentially what this figure tells us is that most domains that were being shared on Twitter during the protests are classified by NewsGuard as reliable. They have a reliability score of 60 or higher. And in panels B and C, we see that there is really no clear association between uh, reliability scores and ideological um, scores as assessed through these uh, 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 party and outlook favorability, favorability um, uh, numbers. Now back to this figure. So the color encodes this reliability score. Um, and so um, essentially what figure D perhaps gives us a, a, a easier figure to interpret. In figure D we show the same communities, but in this case, uh, as they fall in the two dimensional space defined by the ideology scores, uh, the red dashed lines mark the medians of the distributions. And so essentially what this figure tells us is that most communities share URLs to reliable content, um, even those uh, on the extremes of the ideological distributions. Uh, communities with users sharing less reliable sources are very small. So you see this very small community that's kind of reddish. <laughs> um, um, you know, so they are very small in the large scheme of things. They really don't matter that much in terms of volume, but they are in the right-leaning quadrants of the ideology distributions, confirming something that we kind of already knew, which is that misleading information or untrustworthy content is particularly appealing to right-leaning audiences. So to give you a more qualitative insight here, we look at the top 10 communities in the retweet network. Um, so panel A reproduces the figure that I just showed you. Uh, in panel B, we extract the top 10 communities in terms of size, which again, remember, is the number of unique accounts that are classified in each community. And so in panel C to E, we expand on this subset. Um, um, and so in this version of the visualization, we assign average ideology scores um, to the communities. And um, I kind of realized after <laughs> the compiling this figure that the, the color scheme is somehow misleading because if you, you know, all these scores are above the zero line. So they would all be red if we were um, doing this right. Um, when you look at the average party and outlook scores for each of these communities, um, they are all above the zero line. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the color scheme shouldn't be going from blue to red, it should all be red. Um, the two largest communities are communities number one and number 20. Um, so they are labeled in panel C. Um, users in these two communities do not retweet each other, right? Even though they are not that far apart in terms of their average ideology scores, which again, we derive from the URLs that are being shared within the communities. The most central user in community number one is an American attorney who specializes in civil rights. Um, and the most popular news domain in this community is CNN.com. The most central user in community 20 is a conservative talk radio host. The most popular news domain is foxbusiness.com. And so what we aim to illustrate here is that there is evidence of selective diffusion dynamics, right? There's a structural hole clearly separating two sets of communities, um, uh, and in particular communities 20 and community one and the communities around them. You can see these two clusters more clearly in panel A. Um, um, and so this is suggestive of a divide in the diffusion of Black Lives Matter messages across two distinct sets of users and perhaps even counter-attitudinal kind of sharing. 
But these two groups do not map onto the two halves of the ideological continuum. As, again, as I said, the, the party and the outlook scores are all above the zero line. And what this means is that there is a right-leaning slant in the sources that are being shared across the network. Now, you may be wondering why we have two versions of Outlook. The reason is uh, that um, you know, we, Outlook has you know, as originally asked the question, is like, how do you think of yourself? Very conservative, conservative, middle of the road, liberal, very liberal. And so we, uh, op we kind of deconomized that um, using two different um, versions, right? In one case, we classified as liberal someone who was either very liberal or liberal, say, same for the other side of the ideological continuum. In another version, we only focused on the extremes. And so uh, in general, results don't really vary uh, too much independently of which version we use, even though we lose a lot of information when we use the more, more restrictive definition of outlook. Anyway, what do we conclude uh, of all these? Well, as a summary in this paper, remember we wanted to address the question of who produces news coverage and how audiences respond to that content um, in the same um, kind of social media stream that is used to organize the protests. From the supply side, we find that most of the news posted on social media as these massive pro uh, uh, street protests were unfolding were produced by media with a right-leaning ideological slant. And from the consumer side, we also find that the right-leaning, um, that, that this right-leaning news content generated, generated more engagement. And by engagement, I mean retweet activity, thus increasing its reach. And so our work shows that on one of the most prominent political issues of the 21st century, the perspective of right-leaning outlets dominated on Twitter, which is a surprising finding considering the well-documented population advantage that uh, liberals have over conservatives on the platform. Um, but these findings are somehow also consistent with uh, studies of the right-wing media ecosystem, which has developed as an alternative to mainstream media and regularly um, attracts mass attention on controversial issues. So let me just circle back and stop talking so that we can have the Q and A. Um, so let me try to put everything <laughs> together and go back to this question: What are we learning about the current media landscape? So essentially, what we're learning is that one of the big difficulties uh, that we confront today is not only that the media landscape has become um, way more decentralized than it used to be; it is also that information is flowing through all these parallel channels, the web, social media, TV, radio. And not only are we uh, far from measuring in accurate and reliable ways exposure in each of these channels, but we are um, even farther from understanding spillover effects. Uh, only about, say, 20 to 25% of the online population is on Twitter, uh, but journalists are overwhelmingly on Twitter. And so whatever happens on Twitter will, will percolate to what we watch on TV or what we read in our traditional newspapers. Likewise, um, and as we show in the papers that I discussed, a lot of the content produced by mainstream media or by kind of um, established news organizations um, percolates through Twitter. And I think that we are still far from understanding these dynamics. The other problem um, is not so much what digital technologies do to our news or our information exposure, but how they actually allow us to opt out. And this is the choice that a large fraction of the online population uh, seems to be making when it comes to um, high quality news. Um, I think one of the priorities for future research is to look at this huge chunk of the online population that do not seem that interested in news and ask so where are they getting their information, right? Are they more vulnerable to misinformation campaigns just because they cannot contrast that with uh, legitimate news? And this is a question that requires meeting these people where they are and not where we would like them to be, meaning watching news on TV or, or, or going to the New York Times website. So the bottom line is there is a lot of work that we still need to do. And as we think about how to do that work, um, I think we should go back to the discussion about measurement and the opportunities and challenges that we face in this digital age. And I think that the two most important challenges that we have to think about, um, and we discuss these challenges in detail in this paper that I already mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the two most important challenges have to do with uh, platform control of data access and with ethics. Uh, and I think this is not news to anybody, but increasingly the data that we need to make 
inform decisions about how to curate online content or how to regulate the, the role of platforms lies in the hands of the platforms themselves. And um, even though there are a few initiatives that are intended to strengthen collaboration be between those, those platforms as um, uh, sort of between the platforms and academic uh, or independent researchers, those initiatives are not enough to answer all the questions that the research community has. And there is not an agreement um, I would say we don't even have an agreement on what the most important research questions are. Um, so I think we have to do more to kind of force that kind of um, common agenda and put pressure on companies to allow us to access the necessary data to answer the questions that we all agree should be answered. And related to data access is the question of ethics, right? And how ethical considerations might lead to restrictions in data access and to the employment or to the employment, sorry, of anonymization techniques that add noise to the data and make it less granular and potentially less useful, uh, but safer. And so these are, I don't think there's any easy way of solving any of these questions, um, but the answers that we provide to these questions will definitely delimit the research space in which we operate um, in the next decade, especially those of us in communication <laughs> department. Uh, uh, and so I think that I'm, I think I'm going to stop here um, and open this up for discussion so that I can also hear your thoughts. Well, thank you, Dr. gonzalez Bailon. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, so let's open it up to the floor. So maybe I can start with an oriented question uh, since I already have my hand up. <laughs> so I'm wondering about this idea where you talk about opinion leaders and uh, hyper, like hyper consumers of political news. So to what extent of that are actual users and to what extent of that are bots? Because we know a lot of these activities that you uh, described in your second study, maybe a lot of the retweet activity is between bots and not actually humans so what can you briefly comment about that part like how do we understand who are political influencers are they humans are they bots and what are their effects on the media landscape yeah um, so when i talked about opinion leaders that was in the context of the data that we analyzed from the nielsen panel so we know for sure that those are humans because we have the demographic attributes and you know like nielsen's business model relies on recruiting humans not not bots the, of course the question is for that argument to have any validity, right? The idea is that yep. these political junkies who are consuming information with more intensity than the average human being, <laughs> they are then curating. I mean, they are. we talk a lot about algorithmic curation. We don't talk enough about social network curation. I mean, human networks, right? Like, so these are the people who then go on social media and start posting things, their opinions, okay. their, you know, whatever URLs to news piece, pieces that they liked or they want to discuss. Or, and so they do have an, uh, so they do have an impact on the information that ends up circulating online, right? They are really creating another form of curation. And this falls in line with the original intuition that Lazarus Fell and Katz had about opinion leaders mediating, you know, mainstream kind of mass media and the public. Um, um, we didn't follow, I mean, we don't actually have anything in the second project where we actually look at Facebook, at sort of at, at Twitter data um, to test that intuition, right? And it's actually very difficult to test because, um, because we don't, you know, we don't know who these Twitter users are, right? So ideally, we would be able to follow the political junkies that we have already established exist to follow them around to then see how they behave on Twitter or how they behave on Facebook, but we can't do that, right? Like our we try to see that uh, when we compare TV, web, and YouTube, but that's it. We can't go beyond that, right? And so we don't actually know if the sort of people that we characterize demographically with the Nielsen data um, are actually behaving as opinion leaders when it comes to Twitter social media information. To the question of how much of this retweet is being done by bots, the analysis that we've done suggests that it's not. And this is this was actually the core question of one of the, the prior study where we looked at protest activity in, in Spain and, and France. We that, that was one of our driving hypotheses, right? Like so if we see a difference in the salience of new sources on Twitter compared to the web, meaning if a new source that is very peripheral on the web in terms of audience reach is very central on Twitter. Could that be because you have an army of bots like pushing up visibility for those sources? We didn't find any evidence of that. And we didn't find any evidence that that bots um, are 
creating their own kind of dynamics <laughs> in, in, in the data that we were analyzing. Um, so, 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 but having said that, I mean, a, a lot of the news outlets that we label media accounts, they are literally bots. Like they are built to push news on your feet, right? They belong to the New York Times or they belong to CNN, whatever. They are bots. <laughs> But we, you know, we don't want to put all bots in the same category because then it becomes not, it's not very useful to explain things, right? Like, so I think I would say that there are good bots and bad bots. Not all bots are bad, right? Some bots are like literally owned by news organizations. Um, so, but, but I think your question is very important. I think we need to understand better what opinion leaders, what role opinion leaders really do play. Define across the different media channels, right? Opinion leaders are opinion leaders across. They do the spillover, you know, from information that they consume on one channel to the next. And that's very tricky to do without following them around, which is challenging giving our privacy concerns, right? Like it's not something that a lot of people would be willing to let you do. Um, yeah, I, I guess the critical question is there's this assumption between study one and study two that the heavy consumers are also the heavy producers. Mm. Um, social media, but that's very difficult to, to verify, is it? Because people may have a lot of intake of political information, but the critical question is, where are these people in their networks? And what is the scope of their social influence in the broader either online or offline media landscape? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the short answer is we don't know, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Most, so the most, sent, and so would this, when I gave you this vignette of kind of like the top 10 communities in the network, and I told you the most central user here is this conservative radio host and the most central user here. I mean, um, they are, they seem real. I mean, they, seem, they are real people. Like in the context of the retweet network, the most central users are um, not bots. And there's a lot of face validity to the fact that they are the most central users knowing what we know about their own ideological positions. That centrality in a retweet network make you an opinion leader? I don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. So that was very careful not to talk about opinion leaders in the second study because I don't think measuring centrality in retweet networks helps us identify opinion leaders. Um, so, so I think I'm with you in the sense that it's difficult and we should be careful how we think about opinion leaders. I think it makes more sense in the context of the first paper um, to the extent that this is an, these people are outliers. <laughs> they really are very unrepresentative of the news consumption habits of most uh, individuals. Great, thank you. Uh, Mako, let's turn it to you. Yeah, I'm, I, so I have, a, I have a few questions, but I, my first question was kind of, I mean, I, I'm trying to decide if it's the same question that Yuan just asked. Um, I think it maybe is. Uh, um, it's the, but it's in the first study, like, like uh, what's the, there's a logical leap between sort of like consuming media on multiple platforms and being an opinion leader. I'm much more willing to say that someone who's retweeting stuff in a central retweeting network, that seems like a much less controversial claim to me because at least they're producing something. You have some evidence of like information sharing, right? Like, I mean, I buy the network argument that like maybe that's not the right sort of like sort of that's not the right measure of sort of like, like way of measuring it. But like, like, why do we like what, what's the like why do we think that consuming news on multiple platforms makes you like an opinion leader or even makes you someone who's likely to say anything at all yeah i mean i guess that like uh i guess the question is like like do you have measures of non like the second part of the question was do you have uh, do you have measures of sort of like non-passive sort of like like media, simple sort of like consumption do you have measures of more like sort of like active engagement or sharing so for the web panel data or for the yeah, right. media data? So measuring engagement with web, uh, uh, with, with, with web tracking data requires you to define engagement differently than what you would do on sure. Facebook or Twitter. Or, and so we do have a measure of time spent, right? Which is what we use as a proxy to engagement. Obviously spending five seconds on, on a news domain is not... Um, it, it sort of it doesn't suggest the same amount of engagement with the actual content than spending um, 20 minutes. Um, and so that's the only metric that we can use to try to infer meaningful processing of information. Because again, we are making the assumption that just mere exposure, right? Like, so I started saying, you know, once upon a time, we use surveys to measure exposure to news, which essentially relies on self-declared exposure. And we're really bad at giving accurate answers. 
Now we, we can do more accurate measurements, such as we can actually observe you accessing a news domain. But you know, just accessing a news domain doesn't tell me anything about how you are processing that information. Um, and I just lost, oh, you're here. I thought I had lost you. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this is all uh, what I was trying to emphasize when talking about meaningful measures. Like we do have to do a lot of thinking about what these behavioral trace data allows us to measure and the limitations of those measures. Now, how would you define engagement with the news? I mean, I, I, it's a tricky one. Like the, the amount of time that you spend is a proxy to how much you're engaging with the news. Um, then, you know, you being able to remember the details of what you read would be another measure, but like that's not scalable and you can't just ask people if you have <laughs> passive tracking data because it's passive for a reason. So, um, so we do have that. And I, I, I don't want to lie now, I should reread re my own papers before giving talks. I believe the supplementary materials has some, it's either in the supplementary materials or in my student's dissertation, so I don't know. But we do look at time spent. Um, no, we do look at time spent because it's actually part of the substitution effect. Um, and so, um, so if, if you think that's a good measure of engagement, then we do have that. Now, how does that relate with opinion leaders? What I, what I was trying to say, and I don't know if that got cut out, is that you know if you go to the original source, how Katz and Lazarsfeld define opinion leaders? It's all about mediating. It's like some you know some people don't consume news, or they, you know, and so they rely on those who do to be up to date. But of course, that's like the telephone game. It's filtered information, right? Like so, there's a curation process between the the mass media and the public, that and the curation is done by the opinion leaders. There wasn't a lot of detail in in that original study about new the, the, the networks or, or anything, right? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but the mediation still needs to involve some sort of communication, right? You can imagine a person, I spend so much time consuming news that I literally have no time to tell anybody about it, right? Like, um, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, 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 I, what's the relationship between, and maybe other work has shown this, right? That the relationship between sort of like media, like production and the degree to which I'm communicating that to other people is high, is higher positive, like, um, and, and even so, so yeah, I absolutely agree. And of course, here there's different layers of what we could understand as communicating, right? Like, so in the context of the Twitter data, all we do is just track URLs shared, right? So if you if you share a URL, it's because you want people to see it. And of course, you know, some of the questions that I've received in the past is, but how do you know it's not counter attitudinal sharing? Maybe I'm sharing this to say this is outrageous. And and the truth of the matter is that for most of the tweets that contain URLs, there is no argumentation. It's just sharing the the, the URL, right? So. Um, so, so obviously, you know, how you measure, how you communicate, you know, the, the actual process of communicating and curating, it depends also on data availability, what data allows you to do. Now, Twitter has helped us reconstruct the networks through which information flow much better than Lassus, Fell, and Katz could ever dream of, <laughs> right? They didn't even know how central opinion leaders really are in terms of the social metrics, right? Because it was, an it was very, very difficult to measure. So there was a lot of speculation in that argument. Um, and so now we can measure it, but it's very restrictive. You know, like Twitter is just Twitter. Like who cares about Twitter really? Like we all do research on Twitter because it's relatively easy to measure this, I mean, the kind of diffusion pathways. But of course, if you're really interested in an in-depth or in kind of thick description of communication, right? Like, so how do you actually convey that information? There's nothing about persuasion in Twitter. I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, it's not only the question of passing information on, it's also about how persuasive you are in giving a particular framing. And that's way too sophisticated for the sort of data that Twitter makes available. I totally agree. It's important. It's very important and you know, it's necessary. Um, but so another difficulty that I think, and, and then we'll move on, Nate, but the, another difficulty that we can only point to in the paper is that it is empirically speaking very, very difficult to disentangle social curation from algorithmic curation. There's one paper by Baxi et al, published by Facebook, that, that did that, right? And it turns out that social networks, like the curation of your net of your friends, like your contacts is as powerful or more powerful than algorithmic curation because you know it determines the inventory of content that then gets filtered by algorithms. And so hence the, necess the necessity of getting access to data. And hopefully in a few months, I'll be able to say a little bit more about that because we do have a collaboration with Facebook, but we can't talk about the results yet. But it is very, very difficult to disentangle algorithmic curation and social curation if you don't have privileged access literally to data, right? And, and that it shouldn't be privileged, right? It should be accessible to researchers so that we can all use our you know, collective intelligence. You know, right? There's only so much that, that single projects can do, right? Um, anyway, Nate, you're, should, should we move on? Mac, I know you and I could talk for hours, but. Uh. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, I had sort of two things I wanted to ask about. The first one, um, so about the substitution effect. Uh, if I understood right, uh, you're so, sort of showing like between subject, uh, between subjects substitution effect. You have collected data with repeated measures of individuals and their consumption over time. So I'm curious about why not like look at substitution effect within subjects, like are individuals changing their media consumption patterns over time in ways still be consistent with substitution? Um, yeah. Maybe you could do that with like a panel data analysis. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that would be super interesting. <laughs> we haven't okay. done it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that was one thing. I was just curious if there's like a limitation in the data or is this something that's just down the pipe? Um, so the, the one, one answer to that, and of course, mm -hmm. um, is that, so this data set is not um, easy to, to analyze in the sense it's very, no so it's, it's, um, it's you know you have the logs like literally every row is like uh, it's like a URL and then the you know, like there's several tables it's, it's not easy so for every project I mean it takes a lot of, and I'm talking on behalf of my students yeah like this is not the kind of thing that we could do relatively quickly by just querying a database and getting the data that we need right like so for every single thing you need to create the data frames uh, with the right format to analyze and we haven't done it for, for, for the intra-person comparison, but I think it would be super interesting. We do know that not all panelists stay for the same amount of time, right? So, you know, there's a lot of turnover. Some censoring and things like that, yeah. But exactly, but we can, you know, we can do things with that, like we can control for things. So, so yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it would be super interesting. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, and the second thing is on the, um, in the second part when you, you were using like the bot uh, measure, and um, I'm working on a project about like measurement error based on like machine learning classifications and like in communication research in particular. Uh, and it's pretty early, but I think my, I'm surprising myself a little bit about like how robust, uh, you know, things can be, but also that basically we can do relatively straightforward things to account for these errors. When, Cause everyone's like right now, like validating uh, their models, generating their own ground truth. But we can actually use that ground truth to account for the uncertainty in downstream statistical analysis. Anyway, and so I'm kind of trying to Tell find me more. <laughs> yeah, me so I'm paper. trying to find a few examples <laughs> of of like research or a research where like people would willing to share data with me um, about like it's not my own project. So I might reach out to you. I hadn't heard of this work until now, and so I might reach out to you soon and uh, ask. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Data. Okay. That'd be super interesting. Asking publicly like that, but it's uh, and I was wondering if that's something that you like. It sounds interesting to you. Yeah. So this is something that every time we send a paper for review, we get questions. So the prior paper where we look at French and, and Spanish data that um, we had to find a completely different data set because you know there's path dependence in how, so my, my co-author Manly de Domenico had already built a model and trained it and kind of, and so um, every new reviewer asks for new out of sample performance metrics, and which means that you have to find a new data set <laughs> to see how, well, your classifier generalizes. And there's not too many data sets that you can use for these, right? I um, mean, at some point you exhaust them. And so if you submit many papers at some point, there's no more data sets I can use. Uh, but, but we do know that out of sample, like the, the, the models get worse once you use them in a completely new data set. We know that. Um, my understanding of the literature, and again, like this is something that I think there's a lot of very smart people in computer science working on, um, is that it is one of the frontiers, right? Like, so we keep on, this is an evolving work in progress. Um, and so um, as long as you, I mean, it's better than random and it's better than humans. I mean, it's not having a team of students uh, labeling manually. There's also error there, right? And so um, so I think it, as long as you're careful with how much you um, assume, how, how much certainty you can assume <laughs> in these models, which I think serious people do, I think you're fine. Like I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on, oh, you know, we've classified, I mean, we have to, you have to take the numbers, the percentages with a grain of salt, right? Um, but we did do some manual uh, verification in past work just because reviewers were asking us to do it. And it's a, the most predictable question when you use these kind of classifiers, you always get that question, so. Yeah, I think that the problem of like, you know, can your human coders agree on labels? That's like, I think more of like the problem of like, have you like a concept that you can actually like operationalize effectively. And, but I think once you have that, you can account for the, you know, errors that the classifier makes uh, given the human ground truth. And um, yeah, I think one of the more useful papers on this is like, it's a paper, 
um, well, Gary and King was the senior author on it back in the day. Uh, it's several years old, but it uses, it's called multiple imputation or mm -hmm. over imputation. You may have heard mm -hmm. of that, um, mm -hmm. but I think that it, it can be a good place to start. Absolutely. And this is going to become increasingly central, precisely in what you were saying, right? And, and how we translate theories to measures. Because again, if you're an empirical researcher, at some point you have to operationalize things and measure them uh, with imperfect data. Data are never perfect. So <laughs> um, yeah, no, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Uh, and please do send me your work or get in touch. Yeah, so I wanted to ask uh, uh -oh. another question. <laughs> <Mark is being laughs> uh, and I know Michael has another one, so we take turns. Um, so at the start of the talk, you started with three very interesting sociological outcomes, which is polarization, conflict, and manipulation. Mm. And I was just wondering, uh, you outline a lot of detail about the media landscape, consumption patterns. You do also have a reliability score, but surprisingly, that wasn't very correlated with political affiliation. So I was wondering if you can extend your results a little bit and comment on what we learned about these three things on polarization, conflict, and manipulation from your studies. Yeah, good question. And in fact, you know, the trick is that what I said, I think, speaks way more to the exposure part of the equation than to um, the effects part of the equation. So measuring effects is very, very tricky, right? So, you, so I think there's some logical precedence to improving our measures of exposure, right? If we can measure exposure, we can measure effects. Um, so the so you know, I'm not sure I can say a lot about effects, um, but I think I can say something about polarization. Um, and I guess this is one of the key kind of the takeaway messages of, of the past work I, that is already published, which is, um, you know, theoretically in a polarized, you know, if people are consuming news sources that they are aligned with, you expect a certain type of network to emerge. And then you look at the data and you don't see that. And in fact, you see like the data is super, super dense, right? So then the question is, I don't see evidence of polarization, but, but again, these are the, about half of the population consuming news <laughs> voluntarily. I think social media has a different dynamics when it comes to polarization because of social curation and algorithmic curation and because news find you as, as um, what's his name? Um, Hill the Thuniga would say, the Thuniga would, would say, right? Um, um, news found you, you don't need to, I mean, you don't go looking for news. In our web panel data, it's essentially people that, you know, to a large extent, go out looking for news, right? Uh, my student did look at, uh, Tian did look at the pathways to the news sources, and most of the access to news sources is direct access, right? The sum that comes, gets referrals from social media and whatnot, but, um, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, is there segregation in exposure to news or polarization? Um, I think our data, which is restricted to a particular platform in a particular time period in a particular political context suggests that not that there's no and so the question then is why not and sort of and there's been some follow-up studies about the role that online mediators play in diversifying exposure um, uh, and news aggregators and social media um, and so I think it's time we move on from the polarization <laughs> Uh, and the echo chamber, echo chamber, which is, a, by the way, a joke that it's not even mine, right? So, but this is like hey, people writing about echo chamber effects, they live in their own echo chamber. Yeah, I mean, they should <laughs> start paying more attention to uh, recent research. Uh, and I think most of them would agree, right? Like, but this is, but again, like I'm very, I don't want to undermine the value of providing empirical evidence, but I also want to be very humble and very careful with like that this only applies to a particular data, you know, I think we need to do more work because we really don't understand what happens inside the social media platforms right we really don't understand. Maybe those are more segregated spaces and in fact my prior is they are definitely more segregated spaces right so. Um, where there's more polarization. Why is it because of affordances of the platform is it pages groups is it what is it right. Um, so, um, so that so that would be it. Now, when we talk about effects in communication, we usually talk about persuasion or kind of changing your opinions. And so I think another aspect that is super under theorized, and this is related to what Nate asked before the intra person is the sort of the temporal window. Like, so for how long should you be exposed to a particular type of content before that has a, an impact on your opinions or on your behavior, right? And I, we don't know the answer to that question, right? Like, so what are the cumulative effects of constantly being exposed, boom, boom, boom? Like at some point, does it really change something in your brain and then you start thinking differently? 
we don't know the temporality of that, right? And usually all the research designs that we can implement, even if you are lucky and you can work with these social media platforms to run randomized controlled trials and so assign randomly people to different versions of the feed or whatever, uh, you know, and then assuming you have the resources to then ask questions to these people, survey questions, opinion questions, how do you know when to ask? You know, after how much exposure do you need to ask? What do you think? You know, we don't know. I would say relatively, we know very little about the temporality of, of the effects part of the equation. So I think there's a lot of space there as well for us to capitalizing on these new data possibilities and new, these new research possibilities. We, we need to do more to understand that, um, you know, um, also intraperson variability. One of my colleagues at Annabelle, um, David, he does a lot of work on intraperson variability. <laughs> like, so depending on when you ask someone a question, they will give you different answers, right? It's not that you always feel the same way. It's not that you always think the same way. And so I think we can do more uh, to illuminate, theoretically to illuminate, to illuminate that. And I'm optimistic that we are, we can do it now, but, um, but we don't have full answers. So <laughs> hopefully that addresses your question of what, you know, of what, 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 yeah. why what we find is useful. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pranav, go ahead. Yeah, um, my question was more related to what you ended with when talking about like availability of data and ethics as well. Um, in terms of that, like, you talked a lot about Twitter and like you talked about how maybe it's not as representative just because there's a specific set of the population on Twitter. In thinking more about like more private channels, whether that's like messaging, like WhatsApp or WeChat, or even like closed groups on Facebook or other websites. Uh, where data is like just not available and will probably not be available even from the platform. If you just think of something that's encrypted like WhatsApp, like you're not gonna get that. Um, how would you, in your opinion, study all of these effects and these issues within those spaces? Like what do you suggest doing to kind of tackle that issue? Hmm. So that's like trying to analyze the dark side of the moon. <laughs> I mean, now we have photos of it, but for a long time we didn't. Um, uh, that's a tough one, and I'm not sure I'm going to give you a satisfying answer. I think, I think that there's value in chartering the territory such that we know exactly which pockets are out of reach because of encryption. And then the question is, can we still get some sort of metadata that can help us look at the shadows? I mean, and will those shadows be like in plateau, right? Like, so will they, I mean, they're just shadows on the on the wall projections, right? They're not the real thing, and. Um, uh, I think th th I think there's value in chartering the things that we can do, we can measure um, and the, you know and by extension the things that seem to be out of reach, and then question why are they out of reach? And so if the answer is they're out of reach because these platforms don't let us analyze it, that's not a legitimate uh, barrier, <laughs> I would say, considering the public impact these companies have, right? Um, um, but if the uh, if the answer is because we are protecting privacy, uh, then we have to deal with it, right? And then the question is, well, maybe we don't, you know, can we aggregate the data somehow so that, you know, there's, we lose resolution, there's a number of questions we won't be able to address, but we can still uh, map out, I don't know, the prevalence of misinformation or the, you know, um, but I, but I do, yeah, I do think that even that simple question, right? Like, so, I mean, there's questions we can't answer now because not because the data doesn't exist, but because we don't get access to it. And then there's questions that are out of reach because of legitimate reasons. Um, and so I don't think we have a very clear idea of which questions belong where <laughs> yet. Um, so yeah, that would be uh, my answer. I mean, I mean, if a student asked me that, I would say, but also, you know, you also have to pick the right questions, meaning the questions you can answer. Otherwise, you know, it's self-defeating, right? So there's also, uh, with all this data, we can do a lot of things, but the question is, why should we do them? I mean, the fact that you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? Like we can do lots of stuff with, but then there's also, there's like, is there something we should be able to do that is feasible to do, but that we can't do because we don't have data infrastructures or because we don't have, the techniques to parse data or whatever, then if then if, if for those, I think it, we all have to make an effort to try to push current frontiers. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. This was a uh, very. Ah, that I can see his hand also. <laughs> okay. Oh, Mako, go ahead. There's a minute. Okay, I have. So I, there's a marker you left in the middle of the talk that I wanted you to come back to. Uh, um, you talked about this, like uh, uh, slide 27, panel D. Uh, you had that sort of like marginal. You had, I think it was marginal effect, but it was basically you showed like a positive coefficient associated. Your depend, dependent variable was uh like was it reach i can't remember but there was something about like uh but that you, you had like a, you had weird leaning conservative and leaning uh republican and you had like opposite signs uh for those two things and you said you'll come back to this later and i wanted to know what the story was there um, oh, oh yeah so yeah you yeah. showed so, later the, the 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 um you showed later like a um a plot where you have the communities and they look pretty correlated yeah. um uh which makes sense i would imagine that 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 party and outlook would be correlated in that way. So is this just a story of like kind of like strange marginal like 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 you know marginal effects and the weird things that happen when you have like two correlated variables or so I think the answer to this question has to do with um uh theory but also with with the actual metric because the favorability score is a pretty simple score if you have more conservatives the score is going to be conservative i mean the, the most scores are going to lean conservative right so it's really dependent on population composition unlike other metrics like i don't know the segregation index which um you know mathematically speaking it behaves better regardless of group size but in this case we have two groups conservatives and liberals republicans and democrats and um and uh, they are correlated, and this is something that political scientists know, but, you, but they are not perfectly matched, right? So you can be conservative and Democrat. Uh, I'm not sure you can be a liberal and Republican, but you know, there's, so it's not, these two variables are tapping onto different parts of your political identity, like partisanship and then political identity. And so, so there's reasons why we measure these two different things, even though they are, I mean, I think the correlation was about I don't want to lie, but I think it was about 0.53 or something, which is okay, but it's not a very strong correlation either. Now, the you know the when I said I would come back to this later is because we have these two measures of, and actually one of the reviewers advised us to drop the outlook variable, which I'm like I don't know because <laughs> it doesn't really change the results, but just you're hiding. You know, it's like focus on partisanship because then you have what you expect. Right? Um, um, I think. The, the conservative scores are more radical, more, more radically tilted to the, to the right. Um, uh, so the, the, there's a longer tail to the right. And that, and so the question to me is, is that, you know, is it because the American population are, tend to, are more conservative than liberal, right? So that, you know, the, the, the mean is not zero, it's, you know, it's a positive score. Or is it because the panelists from the Comscore data that we use to, to assess, to, to extract these measures is not fully representative? But then, you know, surveys, are surveys really capturing what the extreme right people? I mean, you know, there's all sorts of like, are we, is it really reflecting a population compositional thing where, you know, there's more conservatives than liberals, period? Which as a European, I have to say that that's what it looks like sometimes. I mean, I don't know. But so, um, and so, you know, I would have, prefer if both, I mean, I would have preferred, like if, to substantiate these, the conservative of the right hypothesis, it would have been a much stronger message if both would have correlated positively uh, with, uh, with visibility, but that's not what we find, right? And so the way we interpret it is that very extreme conservative uh, domains don't attract as much attention as right-leaning domains that are not so extreme. Because when you put the two distributions together, that's what you, know, that's what you yeah. see, right? Like, um, but I'm not, you know, but I don't know. So in terms of the mathematics of it, right? Like, so the, the measure itself, it's true. Like if you have two groups, Republicans and liberals, and then one group uh, or Democrats, one group is bigger than the other, the favorability score is going to lean towards the largest group. Um, so, and which is, you know, as a summary statistic, if this is what it is, that's fine. But if you are kind of uh, somehow overestimating the number of conservatives in your, in your data, then that's a problem. So I'm still figuring out what exactly is going on there. <laughs> it seems like, I mean, I guess that like for me that, that it, also, it also means that the two correlated sort of predictors and those were marginal effects. They were in the same, they're in the same model. Is that the story? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I think that that's part of the story here is that just like with, even, even though they're not perfectly correlated, right? Like what's, what's left, um, uh, like, like it's just like sometimes just hard to interpret, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and as I, I, said, I, I see the point of the drop drop one of them. Uh, I know, and then they actually said, which is fine. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think the reviewers were amazing in many ways. I'm not criticizing them, but like, I mean, they were fair points. And but he's like, you know, um, 
just, you know, we appreciate the fact that you showed us both variables, but why don't you just drop one? It's like, what, do people actually cherry pick? I mean, I don't know, you know, like, uh, it seems like cherry picking to me, but I mean, it will be okay in the sense that even if you drop the outlook, to be honest, like, there's not a huge drop in R square explained. I mean, you know, it's not that the model fit, fitness ch changes or, but, but now that I know, it's like, oh, I don't know, should I? I mean, so we, we're still, yeah, we're still debating. <laughs> um, even though I also see the point. Uh, but yeah, I'm telling this because if the paper gets published at some point and then you see that one of the variables were dropped, that's the, that's the history. <laughs> Put it in your online supplement. I look forward to reading it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Cool, thank you. Sure, no, this is, this is great. This is very useful for me. I really, really appreciate it. All the comments and questions. Um, and yeah. I hope, how many of you are going to Paris again? I hope I can see many of you in Paris. Yeah, great. Thank so you. we should we should we should meet and catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give a final round of applause to Dr. Gonzalez Bailon for the excellent talking to today. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We really enjoyed it, and thanks to everyone for participating in the colloquium. Sure, it's been a pleasure, Bye. and I'll see you soon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see you. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye.